All right. Hello, guys. So, yes, for this video, I will be discussing about decalcification. Okay. So, first, we are going to uh, define what is decalcification and after which we will also be discussing the consequences of performing and not performing decalcification. We will also be looking into the different um, methods that are utilized in order to perform decalcification as well as our decalcifying agents. Okay, so first. Uh, just like what I have mentioned, so what is the definition of the word decalcification? So, uh, just like what I always um, emphasize, okay, in not just in histopath, but also in my other classes, like for example, in HEMA 1, um, when you are going to look at or when you are going to determine the definition of a particular term, you just have to look at the term itself. Okay, and if we are going to look at the term decalcification, there is the prefix D or D. Okay, so we all know that the prefix D means to remove. And in this case, what are we trying to remove? We are trying to remove the calcifications or the calcium salts which are present in your tissue samples. So the process of decalcification involves the removal of your calcium salts, your phosphate salts, your lime salts, or any other mineral deposits for that matter which may be present in your tissue sample. Okay, so since um, it is not just the removal of your calcium salts, some authors make use of the term demineralization instead of decalcification. Okay, so the other term which we refer to this process is demineralization. If you are going to compare the two terms, okay, the term demineralization is more encompassing. Why? Because Okay, it talks about mineral deposits in general as compared to the term decalcification. But since they are interchangeably used nowadays, okay, actually the term decalcification is even more popular in the laboratory. So <clears throat> we use the ter these terms to refer to the same procedure. So when we say decalcification, therefore, it also involves the removal of your mineral salts, not just your calcium, okay? So that means we can remove calcium salts, we can remove phosphate salts, we can remove lime salts, okay? So mineral salts or mineral deposits are removed in the process of decalcification, right? So one of what, what are some of the um, what, what are some of the common calcium salts which may be deposited in our uh, tissue sample? So we have our calcium urates, okay? We have our calcium urates, we have our calcium phosphates, okay? We also have our calcium chloride, of course, for our teeth samples, and we also have calcium oxalate. Okay, so these are some of the calcium salts which may be deposited in our tissues as a consequence of a particular disease or a particular condition. Okay, so when do we perform the process of decalcification? So usually, the process of decalcification is performed after fixation, especially if you are very sure, okay, you are very sure that calcium or mineral deposits are present in your sample. So say, for example, um, in the laboratory, you receive a bone sample. Okay. So, of course, based on our knowledge from our human histology subject, we all know that your bone samples, your bone tissue contains mineral deposits. In particular, we have our calcium salts or calcium deposits which are present in the extracellular matrix of your bone tissue. 
And so, if that is the case, okay, we will or we usually perform the, the, the process of decalcification after fixation. All right? There are also some instances wherein we are not, um, we are not, uh, we are not sure, okay? Or we do not know whether your mineral deposits, okay, are present in your tissue sample. So sometimes your mineral deposits can be present in very small quantities that we are not aware, okay, that your calcium salts or mineral deposits are present in our tissue sample. So say, say for example, for Paul, Paul, ako, okay. So say for example, uh, you received a um, a malignant tumor, okay, or a lesion in the laboratory. So of course, the first thing that comes to your mind is it's it doesn't have, or you will not be aware, since hindi naman lahat, not all uh, lesions or not all uh, tumors contain mineral deposits, right? Yes, we are not sure. Kasi hindi naman siya, it's not as hard as your bone samples, it's not as hard as your uh, as your teeth samples, for example. So these samples, um, in these samples, rather, we can only, or we are only able to determine the presence of your mineral deposits or the presence of your calcium deposits um, during the process of sectioning, okay? So, ma'am, say for example, uh, I received a soft tissue sample in the laboratory. And of course, I was not aware that there are actually mineral deposits um, present in the soft tissue sample. What should I do? Can I still perform the calcification? Yes. So, in some instances, Mineral deposits may be detected in our tissue sample during the process of sectioning, okay? So if that is the case, okay, if that is the case, you can still perform decalcification even if the tissue sample has already been embedded, okay? And you now have your tissue block. So if decalcification is um, performed during sectioning, so this specific type of decalcification is referred to as your surface decalcification, which I will uh, discuss later on, okay? So that means there are actually two instances or two, um, two yes, two instances. Yes, correct, okay? So there are actually two instances wherein we can perform the process of decalcification. So number one, after fixation, and number two, during sectioning, okay? So you can perform decalcification also. If, for example, that was the only instance when you were able to de detect the presence of your mineral deposits or your calcium deposits, okay? Yes, yeah. so what are the different samples which would require the calcification? So we have, of course, our bone samples, okay? And of course, we have our tuberculous organs, atherosclerotic vessels, teratomas, teeth and microcalcified samples okay so before we go to or before we discuss the different samples that require the calcification in your module okay there is a portion there that um, discusses the different consequences of not performing decalcification and the consequences of performing decalcification. So may I just uh, explain that portion of your module or that portion of decalcification? Okay. Why do we perform decalcification? Because there are consequences if you do not perform decalcification. Okay, so what are the different consequences or what are the different steps which will be affected if decalcification is not 
performed at all or if the calcification is inadequately performed. So meaning, nag-decalcify ka naman, pero hindi complete yung decalcification. The decalcification process that you performed is incomplete. It is inadequate. So it would, it would also lead to the same consequences of not performing decalcification. So the specific step which will be affected okay, of not performing decalcification or if or of performing decalcification inadequately or incompletely would be the sectioning step okay, in your tissue processing. So dun mo makikita, it is in that particular step that you would be able to, uh, to observe the consequences of not performing or inadequately performing your decalcification process. So in particular, okay, what will be the effect of, uh, of this? Number one, it will lead to the poor cutting of tissue samples. Okay, particularly if we are handling hard tissue samples in the laboratory. So remember, okay, remember that hard tissues, if they are very hard, ha, in this case, very hard tissue samples, like in the case of your bones and teeth, for example, they are very difficult to cut during the process of sectioning, okay? So there is a very high probability that you will not be able to uh, produce good sections from your block. So that is poor cutting of your tissues, poor sectioning of your tissues, okay? So apart from that, due to the hardness of your tissue sample, so this is more likely to damage the knife edge of your uh, microtome knife, okay? So if, for example, your, the edge of your microtome knife is damaged, again, you will not be able to produce good sections also from your tissue block, okay? Another, okay, another uh, consequence of not performing the calcification or inadequately performing the calcification is that it will lead to the formation of bone dust and other cellular debris which will tend to obscure the different microanatomic details which are supposed to be examined or observed by the pathologist during microscopic examination. Okay? So, tatakpan. Kasi pag nag ka, diba? when, when you perform your uh, sectioning later on, okay? So, if you did not remove your calcium salts, magkakaroon ng bone dusts or cellular debris. And these bone dusts will, uh, will, will, will obscure, tatakpan niya, mapupunta po siya doon sa section. Okay, so thereby obscuring um, the different microanatomic details which will interfere with microscopic examination later on. And of course, um, it will affect okay, the diagnosis of the pathologist. Okay, so what if the significant structures that the pathologist uh, should examine or observe under the microscope was obscured? Hindi niya nakita. Okay? So it was not observed by the pathologist. So of course, this will now lead to the misdiagnosis of your patients. Okay? So another, um, <clears throat> if for example naman you are going to perform decalcification, there are unavoidable consequences also of performing decalcification. Okay, so what are the different unavoidable um, consequences of performing the calcification? So if um, it is sectioning that is uh, particularly affected, if, if the calcification is not performed or if it is inadequately performed, okay, the step 
on the other hand, which will be affected if you perform the calcification is staining. Okay? Yan. So, staining. So, affected if the calcification is performed, um, that would be your staining. Okay? So, in particular, okay, in particular, um, you would be able to observe that the different tissue components, they may fail to stain properly. Okay? They may fail to stain properly. Okay? And um, in this case, yan, a failure, yes, a failure of your tissue components to stain properly, this is uh, compounded, okay? Or um, this is made worse by, number one, over-treatment in your acid, okay? Because remember that when we consider the general principle that is involved in the staining process, a basic structure, a basic structure should have a higher affinity to your acidic tie. An acidic structure should have a higher affinity or should have an affinity to your basic dyes. Okay, so that means the underlying principle, the general underlying principle of your staining, the staining process is actually based on pH. Okay? The pH of your stain and the pH of your structure. However, since in decalcification, in uh, most of the processes or most of the methods that we use for decalcification utilizes your acids, it um, ano tawag doon? Sinisira niya, okay? Um, the pH nature of your structures, okay? Ano ang sinisira? It interferes, okay? It interferes or it um, destroys, kumbaga, okay? It interferes or it, it destroys the uh, pH nature of your structures, Okay, so that's why uh, staining is the step which will be greatly affected if you perform the calcification. Okay, so much more if you overtreat or you immerse your tissue samples in prolonged periods of time in your acid. All right, so that's why if you're going to look at the different steps in tissue processing. It is only in the, the in the, 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 the in the decalcification process or in the decalcification step that we have to assess whether the process of decalcification is already complete or not. Why? Because again, over treatment, over immersion of your samples in your decalcifying agent will lead to uh, will lead to, to <laughs> sorry, will lead to uh, consequences which are very dif difficult, which are very difficult to remedy. Okay, so it will compound the uh, consequences. It will make the consequences worse. So that's why do not overtreat your samples in your acid solutions. Okay. Another, this is also compounded by insufficient washing out of the acid. Okay? So, parang, para ka rin lang the, the uh, rationale, if there is insufficient washing of your uh, samples, um, is that there is or there would still be a prolonged interaction between your tissue sample and the acid, right? Parang over-treatment din yaan. Kasi, hindi mo natanggal. You were not able to remove all of the acids from your tissue sample. And so, your tissue sample, okay, your tissue sample will be exposed still to your acid. So that's why after performing the process of decalcification, so if, for example, the decalcification process is already complete, 
you have to ensure that your tissue sample has to be washed properly, completely, so that there is no prolonged exposure of your tissue components to the acid. Okay? Ayan. So, in particular, what are uh, the effects of decalcification in staining? So, in staining, what will be greatly affected would be the action of your basic dyes. Okay? So, say for example, if we consider um, the recommended staining procedure for histology. Again, what's the recommended staining procedure for histology? Okay, yes, very good. So, it's good that you can still remember. We have your H and E staining technique. Okay? So, the basic dye that is incorporated in your H and E staining technique is, of course, your hematoxylin. So, if you perform decalcification, there is a probability that hematoxylin may be inhibited. Okay, so I repeat, the action of hematoxylin may be inhibited. So, since hematoxylin is a basic dye, so what, what uh, particular cellular structure is stained by your hematoxylin? Kung basic dye siya, of course, it will stain an acidic structure. Tama? It will stain an acidic structure. And in your cell, acidic structure is your nucleus. Diba? It contains your nucleic acids. So the presence of your nucleic acids, particularly your RNA, in your nucleus, uh, this renders, okay, this renders the uh, basophilic uh, basophilic character of your nucleus. So always remember this. I will share it na now so that uh, you will be able to understand what I am talking about. Okay, so the rule here in staining is that okay, ang rule natin sa staining is that for our basic dyes, okay, so our basic dyes, they will stain your acidic structures, right? So, these acidic structures, because they have a high affinity to your basic dyes, they are therefore referred to as basophilic. Tama ba? Okay. They love basic dyes. Basophilic structures. So, do not be confused, ah. Okay. And so, I repeat, your basic dyes they will stain your acidic structures. That's the general rule that we have in staining. And since these acidic structures have a high affinity to your basic dyes, we therefore refer to them as basophilic. Okay? So in contrast, if we are going to consider your acid dyes, your acid dyes in general will stain your basic or alkaline structures. Okay, therefore, your basic structures have a high affinity to your acidic dyes. That's why we refer to them as acidophilic. Okay, so that's the rule, right? Ayan. So in the case of hematoxylin, sige, right, right tayo here. In the case of your hematoxylin, so hematoxylin is a basic dye, right? Yes, it is a basic dye. And so, if we are going to look at the different, different structures which are found inside your cell, it will, it is supposed to stain your nucleus. Mom, why nucleus? Because, okay. Mom, why nucleus? This is because your nucleus is considered to be an acidic structure. Right? Yes. Okay. Uh, from your human histology, alam natin yan, ang nucleus ay isang acidic structure. Ma'am, what makes it acidic? Um, the presence of your nucleic acids in your nucleus makes your nucleus acidic. Particularly, what nucleic acid? We have your RNA. Okay? Yes. Um, this knowledge is very important. Even in your, even in the staining characteristic of your cells in hematology. All right. So anyway, <clears throat> so since 
um, the action of your hematoxylin is affected. Okay? The staining of the nucleus of your cell will be greatly affected also. So in particular, you would be able to observe a failure for your nuclear chromatin okay, and the other nuclear structures to take up hematoxylin. So if you are going to look at your nuclear chromatin, ano ba ang, what particular biomolecule is or makes up your, your chromatin fibers? It's your DNA. It's a nucleic acid. Okay, nakuha? Alright, so um, the organelle which will be greatly affected, therefore, is your nucleus. So the nucleus of your cell might not be stained, okay? Because, yun nga, in the calcification, what is oftentimes affected would be your basic dyes, okay? So in contrast, your acidic dyes naman, your acidic dyes, right? So for your acid dyes, Okay, particularly in your H and E staining technique, what is the acid dye that is incorporated? It's your eucin. Okay, so your acid dyes, they are less affected. They are less affected by the process of decalcification. However, okay, please take note that if, for example, your acid dyes will likewise be affected, this will lead to a deep, brick red stain okay a deep brick red stain of your uh, of your basic structures or of your acidophilic structures and there will be no differential staining okay deep brick red stain without okay without differentiation so pag sinabi natin differentiation if you look at your cell, okay, after, after staining your cell or your tissue components, although your acidic structures would have the same color or hindi naman siya yung sobrang the same color. So, kunwari, um, pare-preha silang acidic, right? Pare-preha silang red or pink in color. But if you're going to look at look at the structures under the microscope there are varying degrees of redness there are varying degrees of uh, pinkness sorry okay of redness or pinkness or orangeness or yellowness of your structures oo pare-pareha silang red pero magkakaibang red ang nakikita natin under the microscope Yes, they are all pink, but we have we have several uh, degrees of pinkness, di ba? Magkakaiba sila. Yung iba, some structures are, are light pink, some structures are 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 are. are. <laughs> ah, so, okay, some structures are light pink, some structures are dark pink in color, some structures are are deep red. Some structures are are light red. Diba? Magkakaiba sila. Although pare-pareha sila, all of them are considered to be acidophilic. Okay? The degree of color, of, of redness, for example, is different. So that is what we refer to as differentiation. Okay? Hindi sila pare-parehas ng pagka-red. Kumbaga. Okay, so in uh, if, for example, your AUCN will be affected. Okay, what will be the color of your what will be the color of your acidic structures? They will have the same color. And what color is that? We have deep brick red. There is no variation in the color. There is no difference in the degree. Okay, of brick red coloration of your acidic structure, uh, I'm sorry, of your basic structures. Pare-pareha sila. All of them will have the same deep brick red color. Okay? So that will be the effect 
of your of performing decalcification in staining. All right. So another effect of performing decalcification is that it will lead to the distortion or damage of your tissue samples. Okay. So take note. Guys, I will erase this portion already ha, so that I can write other important things. Okay. So take note that your, your calcified samples, particularly if we are going to consider your bones and your teeth samples, they are considered to be specialized type of connective tissues. Tama po ba? Okay. So they are specialized type of connective tissues. And one particular characteristic, particularly of your bone samples, is that they contain a lot of extracellular matrix. Right? Yes. If you go back to what you, what you observed under the microscope in human histology, what did you observe? You observed only a few of your osteocytes, right? Okay. So under the microscope, ang nakita natin, what we observed in our bone tissue is that you have osteocytes which are arranged very far from each other. Okay? That's your bone tissue. And in between, okay, in between your osteocytes would be your ground substance or your extracellular matrix. Okay? And so what can we what can we conclude, therefore, that the extracellular matrix of your bone tissue is a significant component of your bone tissue? So that means if you destroy the extracellular matrix, the ground substance of your bone tissue, then the entire bone tissue will be lost. It will also be destroyed you will not be able to maintain or to preserve the architectural pattern of your bone tissue. And that's the problem in decalcification. Okay? So since in decalcification, we make use of our acid solutions, the problem with our acid solutions is that they are injurious to the ground substance, they are injurious to the extracellular matrix. Okay? Not just your cells, but particularly to the extracellular matrix of your tissue. Alright? So, just like what I have mentioned, if you destroy my country, if you destroy the extracellular matrix, if you destroy the ground substance of your bone tissue in particular, then the entire tissue will be lost. Okay? So that's the problem. Hindi lang cells ang apektado, but also the ground substance, which are present in high amounts in your connective tissue, if you can still remember your human histology. Okay? So yan. So your acids, yeah, your acids, they will tend to distort and damage your tissue samples. That's why it's very important for us, class, to ensure that if complete decalcification is complete, if complete decalcification is complete, or if the decalcification is already complete, then you stop decalcification. You remove your tissue sample from your decalcifying agent. Otherwise, that will lead to overtreatment. Okay? And if, for example, decalcification is complete, you remove the tissue sample from the acid solution. You have to wash it immediately. And in the washing out of your acid solutions from your uh, tissue samples, you have to make sure that all of the acid solutions are completely removed from your tissue sample. Otherwise, okay, it this uh, mistakes, okay, uh, that we perform in the process of decalcification will aggravate 
Mm, grabe naman. Okay. It will aggravate the effects of your decalcification process. Okay? Another effect of your decalcification process is that the sections which are produced, they tend to float off during the process of staining. Okay? Sections tend to float off or they are washed out during the process of staining. Okay? So, <clears throat> in the process of staining, particularly if we consider your H&E, your, &E, your hematoxylin and eosin staining technique, so, this technique requires the use of your decolorizer, okay? This technique um, requires the use of your decolorizer or otherwise referred to as your differentiator, okay? So, in your h &E technique, the decolorizer or the differentiator that is utilized is your acid alcohol, all right? Yes. So the floating out of your, uh, floating off rather, and the washing out of your sections during staining, sorry, uh, this is observed, observed after the immersion in your decolorizer or differentiator. So a good example of the decolorizer that is incorporated in our staining techniques, we have your acid alcohol. So, you have your slides, okay? You have your slides, and then if you immerse it, after immersion, pag taas mo, if, if you, if you, ang hirap naman, Miss Naide, ha? You should learn a lot of Tagalog, okay? Um, if you tanggal, if you remove your, uh, your slide, wala na. The section has already fallen. Ah, uh, the section has already been washed out, okay? Or it has floated off your slide already, all right? So, yeah, that is another unavoidable consequence of decalcification, okay? So, in order to uh, prevent, okay, in order to prevent the floating off or washing out of your sections during staining, there are several things that you have to take note of. Number one, you have to check your slides, okay? You have to check your slides after the de paraffinization. So, check slides, okay, after the paraffinization, okay? So, check slides after the paraffinization, all right? So, what are you supposed to check? You check if the sections are peeling off your slide, okay? So, remember that since you performed flattening or straightening of your sections during flotation, dapat perfectly flat siya. Your sections, okay, your sections, so say for example, this is your, this is your slide, okay? So, say for example, that's your slide. So, your sections, they have to be completely flat okay they have to be completely flat um, on top of your slides so if for example signs of peeling off are observed so ano yung signs of peeling off ma'am so your sections may paganyan ganyan siya okay it is not completely flat on your tissue uh, on your slides. So if that is the case, that is a sign that your section is loosening from your from your um from your slides. Okay? And so if for example, uh, you were able to see signs of loosening or peeling off of your tissue sections from your slides after deparaffinization and drying, you have to perform what we refer to as collagenization. Okay? Collagenization. Or you have to collagenize your sections prior to staining. Okay? So the term 
collagenize, this comes from the reagent that is utilized in order to ensure that your section is uh, completely adhering to your slide. Okay? And what reagent do we use to collagenize your sections? We make use of your collagen. Okay? We make use of your collagen. Collagen, this is otherwise referred to as your celloidin. Okay? So, I repeat. The other term that we use um, in place of the term collagen is celloidin. So, your collagen or your celloidin, this is the reagent that we use in order to ensure that the sections completely adhere onto your slides, onto your glass slides. Okay? But class, ha, may, I just, um, may I just tell you that there is no such word as celloidinization. Walang ganun, ah. Walang ganun. Collogenization or collogenize only. But we do not, there is no such term as celloidinize or celloidinization. Okay? Okay? Are we clear? Yes. All right. So, after all of this discussion, what can we, ang haba talaga ng discussion ko, okay, what can we, uh, what can we conclude? Okay. So, uh, what can we conclude? We can conclude that there is actually no ideal um, decalcifying method. Okay, or there is no ideal uh, way by which we can uh, we can we can perform the process of decalcification. Okay, why? Because if you do not perform it, there are consequences. If you perform it, there would all there would always be consequences also. Okay, yes. Yeah. So decalcifying solutions always. Uh, produce distortion and alteration of your tissue sample. So your um, decalcifying solutions, they will always have an effect when it comes to staining. All right? So, yan. Okay, so going back to the different samples that we use or that we, that we use, that we uh, that we that we that are needed <laughs> that are needed to be decalcified okay so let us just try to uh, um, recall your knowledge on activity one okay so what specific material again is utilized in order to cut okay or in order to make uh, smaller pieces, smaller pieces of your calcified or mineralized tissue samples. All right, yes, that's correct. So we have your prezzo. Okay, so in some of the references that we use in histopath, okay, so instead of your, instead of the term prezzo, okay, so other kinds of sauce, other kind of sauce that uh, may be utilized for the sampling of your mineralized uh, samples would include your band saw, okay, or your jeweler's saw, okay. I think your band saw um, and your jeweler's saw, they are finer as compared to your fret saw, okay. The reason why we have to make use of your saw is that your saw um, produces, so this materials produces less tearing, okay, less tearing of the surrounding tissue, okay, so it produces less tearing of the surrounding tissue, right, so that's why you have to make use of your sauce in the sampling of your calcified or mineralized uh, calcified or mineralized samples, okay? Yes, so the different samples that require decalcification, uh, they can be divided into two on how, yes, they can be divided into two groups and this depends on how we are supposed to prepare your tissue, tissue samples, all right? So for bones and other 
uh, and other calcified samples. Like, for example, we have your tuberculous organs, your atherosclerotic vessels, your teratomas, okay, bones, and all of this uh, other, other calcified or mineralized tissue samples. You have to cut them in small pieces. Okay, you have to cut them in small pieces and then, of course, you perform the fixation process after which you perform decalcification and then you have to remove the decalcifying agent. Why do we have to cut them in small pieces? Remember that the decalcification process, it has to be, uh, it has to be carried out fast so that Exposure of your tissue sample, exposure of the different components of your tissue sample to your decalcifying solution will be reduced. It will be decreased. Okay, so it's very important that even prior to fixation, you have to cut your samples in small pieces. Okay, yeah. So the recommended fixative for our samples is 10% neutral buffered formalin, okay? So the reason why we are recommending your 10% buffered, buffered neutral formalin is because of the fact that this fixative penetrates well, okay? It penetrates your tissue samples well, and it renders... Uh, the different soft tissues resistant to your acids. So I repeat, your 10%, okay, so I, I repeat the repeat. The, <clears throat> the recommended fixative, again, is your 10%, okay, we have your 10% um, neutral buffered formalin, okay, buffered uh, formalin. Okay. The reason why we are recommending this is because um, this fixative penetrates your tissue samples well and it renders your soft tissues resistant to acids. Okay. Yes, yeah. so that is how we are going to decalcify your bones and other, uh, and other uh, calcified samples. Okay. So in the case of our teeth samples, Yes, what can you observe or yes, how can you describe your teeth samples? Remember that your teeth samples are very hard, right? Uh, they are even harder as compared to your bone tissue, okay? And the problem with your teeth samples is that they are small. So, uh, matigas sila na maliit, okay? And if, um, if a tissue sample is very hard but small, Okay, they are harder to handle in the laboratory. All right, so just imagine if you are going to uh, cut or make samples of your teeth in the laboratory. Diba? Ang liit niya, ang liit. O paano mo lalagariin yun? How are you going to sew your teeth samples? They are very small, but they are very hard. So that's why, o oh, paano ganun? Diba ang hirap? Okay, eh, buti sana kung sem talaga. Okay, so they are small and they are very hard. So how are you going to make this of your fretso? Remember the fretso, di ba? You have to, you have to, uh, you have to grab it like this, right? As ganun ka, di ba? Oh, it's not, it's laborious. It takes a lot of effort. Okay, baka mamaya, <clears throat> baka later on, the sample that you will be cutting is too small or it might be too big. Okay, so that's why for our teeth samples, uh, because they are small but very hard, maliit na matigas, ang hirap nilang i-handle in the laboratory. Okay, and what should we do for our teeth samples? For our teeth samples, you have to perform partial or complete decalcification. Okay, and then after that, after um, performing partial or complete decalcification, that's the time that you perform cutting. Kasi at least malambot na sila. Okay, so the hardness of your teeth samples have been reduced already. So it makes it easier to cut 
your teeth samples. Pag malambot. Pag medyo, if they become softer. Okay? Or if their hardness is reduced. Alright? Ayan. So, for our microcalcified samples, on the other hand. Uh, this is what I was uh, talking about a while back. That there are some samples, okay? There are some samples which actually contains calcifications or mineral deposits, but you are not aware that calcifications or mineral deposits are actually present in your sample. And we call these samples as your microcalcified samples. Okay, from the term itself, micro. Micro means very, very tiny, microscopic, tiny. Degree of uh, tininess. Ba't pa ang hili ko sa ness ngayon? Okay? Tama? Very, hindi mo alam eh, because they are microcalcifications. So, microcalcifications, they are only observed during sectioning or examination. Okay? And, say for example, um, you detected the presence of micro calcifications during sectioning. Ma'am, how am I going to detect it during sectioning? So during sectioning, okay, so when you uh, cut sections or when you make sections from your tissue block, there is resistance to your knife. Parang ang hirap niyang ikat. Okay, there is resistance to your knife. There is a gritty texture that you would be able to observe. Okay, in Ilocano, yung ay in Tagalog pala, parang nangingilo ka, mangingilo ka pag nagkakat ka. Okay, I hope Miss Naide, you know the term ngilo, nangingilo in, in English. Okay. Yes, I think the English term is gritty. There is a gritty texture to it. Okay? Just like when you eat, ano ba ang mga gritty na may texture? Chico. You know chico, Miss Naide? Yes, it's very yummy. It's a very yummy fruit. Or pear. Oh, I know pear. I know you know pear. Okay? Diba when you eat chico, uh, there is a sandy or a gritty uh, texture to your chico when you eat it. Same is true when you eat your pear, right? The, especially if you are near the core of your pear. So there is a, a gritty uh, or a sandy texture to, to, to it when you eat it. Okay, so that's the same kind of texture that uh, will tell us that microcalcifications are present in our, uh, in our uh, sample. Okay, in our sample. Alright, and for example, if it is detected, okay, if it is detected during uh, sectioning, if it is detected during sectioning, then you have to perform what we refer to as surface decalcification, which I think I have introduced to you a while back, right? So surface decalcification, this involves, <clears throat> this involves um, the use of a gauze or perhaps you can also utilize a cotton that has been soaked with gauze. Lagay ko lang. Nasa inyo yata ito. Okay, yes. Gauze. Gauze or cotton that has been soaked in 10%. Okay, we have 10% hydrochloric acid. Okay. So, you are just going to make patong the block. Okay? You are just going to make patong the block into your uh, gauze or cotton. So, for how long? You have to perform surface decalcification for one hour. So, how are we going to do that? So, say for example, this is your gauze. Okay? This is your gauze or your cotton. So, of course, it has been soaked in... 10% hydrochloric acid, okay? And for example, this is your block. And that's your block. Okay, yan. So of course, the sample, the sample, it, it, is, it is here on this portion. 
Right? Ayan. Ayan yung sample natin. Okay. That's your sample. So, what you are actually doing is you are trying to remove, you are trying to remove um, your calcification or your mineral deposits from the surface only, from this portion only of your sample and not the calcifications or mineral deposits which are present elsewhere in your tissue sample. Okay, that's why it is referred to as surface decalcification. So that means there is also a given, there is only a given thickness, okay, of your sample that uh, there is a certain thickness only uh, of your sample in which you are able to remove your calcifications or your mineral deposits. Okay, so after one hour, what are you going to do? After one hour, then you perform again your, uh, your sectioning. Tama? You perform again uh, your sectioning. So after some time, you would be able to observe again the presence of microcalcification. You would be able again to feel the gritty or the sandy texture in your uh, tissue sample. Okay? If that is the case, then you have to perform again your surface decalcification. Alright? Ayan. So that is what we do or that is the remedy. If surface or if microcalcifications are detected in our uh, blocked tissue sample, blocked tissue sample during sectioning. So another way by which we can detect for the presence of microcalcification is during examination. Particularly if the stain that you utilize is hematoxylin and eucin. So in, in your tissue sample, microcalcifications will appear as dark. Okay, so they will appear as dark, yan, dark granular masses with lighter purple halos. Okay, so I repeat this one. So yan, yung mga yan. Okay, so as you can see, there are dark granular masses with lighter purple halos. So these are microcalcifications. And their presence, or they are commonly present in malignancy. Okay, so they have been um, associated with malignancy. Okay, so commonly found in malignancy. Um, is there anything that we can do if, for example, microcalcifications are detected during uh, examination? Wala. There is no remedy for that. Because you have, you have already prepared your slides. So there's nothing, there's nothing that we can do already. Okay? We cannot remove your microcalcifications kasi nga, na-stain na sila. Your slide had, had undergone all of the steps in tissue processing already. And apart from that, okay, um, the processing of your tissue sample, it did not, okay, it did not uh, interfere with, with other steps. Kaya, kaya nga hindi mo siya na-detect. You were not able to detect it during sectioning. And so, Remember, what is usually affected if the calcification is not performed? It's your uh, staining, sectioning. Okay, it's your sectioning. But since you were able to produce naman good sections from your, uh, from your sample, then it's fine. Okay, yes. So the presence of microcalcifications, um, uh, as long as it does not interfere with sectioning, it's fine. Okay, it's fine po. Okay lang siya. Alright, but of course, if you are uh, able to detect it during sectioning, that means it is interfering with that particular step. And what do we do? We perform surface decalcification. Okay, ayan. So, um, I will just be showing you some pictures. Yes. Okay, so we have here our bone samples. Okay, take note that uh, there are two types of uh, bone tissue, right? There are two types of bone tissue. We have your 
uh, we have your compact bone tissue, and then we have your spongy uh, bone tissue. Okay, yes, we have your spongy bone tissue, and we have your, <clears throat> your compact bone tissue. So you have to remember those kasi um, in histopath, we do not actually make use of the term spongy and compact. Okay? What, we, what are the terms that we use in place of spongy and compact? Compact. compact okay? So in histopath, we make use of the terms cortical bone sample. Okay? Cortical bone sample. And then the other one is your cancellous bone sample or bone tissue. Okay? So, compact bone, ayan, compact bone po, this is referred to as dense cortical bone tissue in histopath. Okay? Dense cortical bone tissue in histopath. Okay? And for your spongy bone, on the other hand, it is referred to as cancellous. Okay? So, it is referred to as Cancellous bone tissue. Okay? Cancellous. Saglit. Yes. Cancellous bone tissue in histopath. Okay? Yan. So, please do not forget. So, this one naman, these are uh, tuberculosis fossae. Okay? These are examples of tuberculosis fossae. And remember that one <clears throat> characteristic of your tuberculosis fossae is that um, they are, they are, they are, um, they are, no, they tend, sorry, they tend to form calcifications also. Kaya nga, di ba, during x-ray, okay, um, if a patient is suffering from tuberculosis, you can actually detect it. Why? Because you can detect the presence of calcium deposits or mineral deposits in the lungs. Alright, so if the tuberculosis fossae is present in the lungs, we actually refer to it as your gon fossae. T H O N. Okay, so if the fossae is present in lungs, okay, we refer to it as your, uh, sorry, gon fossae. Okay, so tuberculosis fossae, it can also be present in other organs actually, like for example, your kidneys. Okay, remember that tuberculosis, it is not just pulmonary tuberculosis. There are also instances wherein um, the causative agent will affect or infect other organs of the body. Uh, those type or that type of tuberculosis is referred to as extra pulmonary tuberculosis. Okay, so when the causative agent infects other organs apart from your lungs or um, Yes, apart or outside of your lungs. Okay, so we have extra pulmonary tuberculosis. Okay, and so other organs, we also have our teratoma. This is an example of a teratoma. Okay, so I think this is an ovary. Yes, and as you can see, the ovary contains hairs, it contains teeth. All right, so there are some, <clears throat> uh, some organs or in your teratoma rather, your teratoma contains structures, structures which are not supposed to be present. Okay, yan. So, meron siyang ngipin. Yung ovary ba? Dapat ba yan? May ngipin, di ba? Hindi naman. And then we have hair in the ovary. Um, another, yes, yan. So, that is an example of a teratoma. It contains tissues or structures which are not normally present. Okay? Another would be our atherosclerotic vessels. So as we all know, uh, plaque formation can take place in our arteries okay, due to the deposition on the arterial wall. Okay? So it will, it will harden your arteries uh, causing now atherosclerosis. Right? So these are the different samples that have to be decalcified, okay, because of the presence of mineral deposits. Um, yes, mineral deposits or calcium deposits, okay. So I think I would have to end the discussion at this time.
Okay, so I will be discussing, yes, the next video I will be discussing uh, the different general considerations, okay, and the different course acids, kung kasha pa siya sa one hour. Right, so I'll see you in the next video.